What do you have to lose right now? I just think people are scared to fail. Being able to understand what it means to have to wait, to be patient. And you're listening to the Yash and Company Podcast. Hey everyone, this is Yashanka Chalasani, otherwise known as Yash. And thank you for listening to another episode of the Yash and Company Podcast. And as you might know, this is a show where we learn from the world's best 20 and 30 year olds, whether these are world-class athletes, nonprofit founders, or as we have on today's show, entrepreneur and CEO of Elevate K-12, through one of the fastest growing ed tech companies in the world, Miss Shaley Burnwall. But before we get started with this episode, I just wanted to take a moment to say thank you for supporting everything that we do here at Yash and Company. And if you wouldn't mind, we'd really appreciate you taking a moment to give us a like, rating, or review on wherever you're listening to the podcast. It's a little thing that goes a long way. So thank you so much. So who is Miss Shaley Barnwall? Shaley is the founder and CEO of one of the fastest growing ed tech companies, Elevate K-12, which brings live streaming instructions to schools and is working to change how K-12 classrooms work. Her mission behind Elevate K-12 was to bring the best quality teaching to all classrooms and create work opportunities for women. She was also the founder of a chain of preschools and restaurants in India. An entrepreneur by heart, she is a production engineer with a teaching degree in early childhood education and an MBA from the Ross School of Business at the University of Michigan. If you do not see her working on building Elevate K-12, through you can see her deeply immersed in a book or scuba diving somewhere. So I actually had the pleasure of meeting Shaley a few years ago when she came through Baylor University um, and was seeking uh, funding for her business, Elevate K-12, through through the Baylor Angel Network, which I was a part of. And I still remember when Shaley walked in that room, uh, you could just knew that there was something different about her. And it's really hard to describe that, but I think the best way to put it is she has that it factor. And I think this is a quality that is sought after so much in the business world, and particularly in startups and entrepreneurship. Because as an investor, you know that when you invest in someone like that, they'll take your money a long way. And so it was really fascinating to record this episode with Shaley and to dive into the things that make her who she is. And I think we have a few answers for that as well on this episode. So excited to share this with you all. Um, On this episode, we dive into a ton of different things, as we always do, including experimentation, which Shelly describes as really what has led to her success in life and in business, Um, her journey to starting Elevate K-12, through what she believes the difference between leaders and disruptors, uh, the Dunbar principles, and of course, all the other random things that we touch upon, as always. So without further ado, here is a long-form conversation with Miss Shelly Barnwall. This is Yash. I am in Houston, Texas, recording this episode with Miss Shaley Burnwall. Uh, Shaley, uh, thanks for uh, joining me on the show. Hey, Yash. Thank you so much for having me here. Of course. And uh, you're joining us from your home base of Chicago. And so, um, you know, ideally, I'd love to have uh, seen you in Texas and recorded this, but um, I'm glad to be doing this over Skype. And uh, I was just telling you earlier that, uh, you know, we might be hearing some uh, thunderstorms um, that are passing through Houston. So if you hear that, apologize. But um, I'm glad to uh, be joining you today and uh, hearing a little about your story. So, um, Shaley, I thought an interesting place for us to start would be um, back in when you were a little girl. So when you were growing up, what did you think you wanted to be? Uh, I wanted to be everything. So I really didn't know what I wanted to be. I think the only thing that I knew growing up, and that really hasn't changed, I think since I was a little girl to now, the only thing that I ever wanted to be was I wanted to do something that I loved. Um, I'm just that kind of person that if I don't like something intrinsically, if I'm not motivated about it, I would just not do it. So no matter what I did in my life, if I loved it, I did really well and I enjoyed it. And if I did not like it, it was a problem. Uh, Over the years, as I matured, I learned to also do things that I don't love, but I always wanted to do something that I was really passionate about. And it took me a while to learn and figure that out. I had to do a lot of life experiments to get there. But I think once I found what I loved, I didn't look back at all. Sure. And um, was it easy to find what you have loved over the years? Um, I don't think I was seeking it as much as I was exploring. Like I said, I've always considered life. And I think this was something that my dad taught me. Life is all a set of experiments um, and a set of decision trees that you have. 
Uh, what I did do was I explored a lot. I was naturally ADD, so that kind of made me explore and try a lot of different things. And when I found something that I loved, I stuck with it. Um, so I think a part of my life growing up was there were things that I had to do that I didn't enjoy. For example, after my uh, school, I had to be a production engineer. I think I learned a lot out of it. I learned a lot about you know, analytics, product, design, but I didn't intrinsically love it. Um, I, I stumbled upon teaching by chance and I absolutely loved it. And that's when I realized that when I do something that I really loved, I really excel at it. Um, I came and chanced upon business school at Michigan, um, something that I really wanted to do. And then merging all three of them to create the Elevate K-12 was again a step that I took. But in between each one of these phases, there were several life experiments that I was doing, which I did not enjoy. And then finally, when I found something I loved, I stuck with it. Sure. And so you were actually, you grew up in India, right? And um, so you didn't come to the U.S. till business school happened. So, um, you know, you were talking about um, finding teaching by chance. So how did, how did you end up in teaching in India? It was actually really interesting. So I... Um, after I finished my production engineering, um, my dad is an entrepreneur and I was working with him and, you know, um, in his company. And then I actually went to drop my nephew to a preschool. And when I went there and I saw the teachers there, I was like, this is something that I would love to do. And I spoke to the principal there. I understood what kind of a course you need to do. And guess what? In a month, I was enrolled in a teacher training degree course. And seriously, that's how it started. I jumped into it as an experiment. And along the way, I realized how much I loved it. So the conclusion of the experiment was pretty positive, I would say. Yeah. And so, and so now when you, when you think about, when I look back at your story, you know, um, you did one experiment, you end up start, you start teaching and then all of a sudden you decide to go to the U S and start business school at Ross. Right. And so, um, that seems like another experiment that you kind of took off the whim. So how did that come about? So I did start teaching as a profession because I wanted to explore something new that I thought that I was going to love. But as I got into teaching, I realized it was more than just teaching or more than just a profession. And the whole idea of you as an individual having the capacity to transform and change somebody else's life by giving them a great experience was immensely valuable for me. I went through K-12, not really enjoying K-12 education for a variety of reasons. The Indian education system can be pretty regimented discipline. So for a creative person like me, it didn't really work. But when I had the power and capacity to really provide a kind of teaching that students would enjoy and would adapt to different learning styles, it was really exciting for me. Coming to business school was a next step. I was in India. I was doing great as a teacher, but I really wanted to explore more. I wanted to see what the world in the United States of America is all about. Um, and coming here to business school was just a natural next step. Uh, but again, when I came to business school, what again I gravitated towards was teaching. So I joined the junior achievement program. And that's when I realized that my passion lies with teaching. And no matter what I do, that's what my nucleus is. And, you know, I somewhere during the business school, I decided that that's what I was going to do. Sure. It seems like uh, one of the things you mentioned, I think, uh, when I was prepping for this episode is you said there's a huge distinction between leaders and disruptors. And this really fascinated me because it seems like that was maybe one of the realizations that um, helped you decide to go to business school. Can you explain a little bit about that perspective, the difference between leaders and disruptors? Sure. Um, that's a great question, actually. So to me, a leader by its very definition would be someone who leads. You can be um, the captain of a ship. You can be the pilot of an airplane. You can be the CEO of a company. You could be the president or the prime minister of a country. You could be the principal of a school. A leader is one who leads a team to get to a certain goal. And that's great. There are many tremendous, amazing leaders in this world. When you think of a disruptor, a disruptor may or may not be a leader. A disruptor could be a scientist. A disruptor is someone who is not happy or satisfied with the status quo. Uh, 
you look at a problem, you look at a challenge, you look at something that's not going correctly and a disruptor's brain automatically goes into overdrive to try and find a solution for it. We are constantly in our brain experimenting and finding the root cause and then finding a solution for it. So a disruptor would be someone who's not excited by status quo and is constantly thinking about changing and involving an antiquated industry or an antiquated product or an antiquated solution. That to me is a disruptor. A disruptor combined with a leader is a deadly combination, I would say. But I think both in their own rights have a very special place in the world. Right. So not all leaders are disruptors, but um, it seems like by almost by its definition that disruptors are in some form or fashion most likely leaders, right? Um, may or may not be. Leaders in thought may not be the leaders of a team. Like scientists could be disruptors and they're just leaders in their thought and what they're leading, but they're leading that experiment. So it depends how you define it, really. Sure. Yeah, but I, I just think that distinction is so important important because in today's world, I think we promote leaders, but we don't really talk about disruptors as much. And I think that the real change in today's world really happens from disruptors. So I just thought that distinction that you made was um, really powerful. Um, and, 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 you know, I really would love to touch upon education because this is something that I'm really fascinated by. Um, so, you know, to me, when I look at education, one of the things that um, I always um, tell my friends about is I don't know if my son or daughter, if, if I were to have a son or a daughter, um, <laughs> would actually end up going to higher education. Mm -hmm. And um, the reason I say that is because, um, you know, kind of like you said, you know, you, you you were frustrated with your experience and growing up in an in Indian educational system. But I think uh, many people in the U.S. would also say that they were frustrated about their experience as well. Mm -hmm. And the reason is because, you know, it's not very personalized. It has been kind of the same for you know mm -hmm. hundreds of years. And um, what you what you really pay for an education for, you know, when I went to college, the real reason I paid money to go was probably not the teaching itself, because I could have stimulated that same teaching with online courses, mm -hmm. but it's really the environment and the people. Um, yeah. And so I'm, I'm really curious when you before even all this and you kind of went into education because you wanted to be a disruptor. Right. Um, what was your kind of perspective on education? Um, interesting. So my perspective on education always was I really until date I love gaining knowledge like I'm constantly looking for opportunities or meeting people or reading books or going into sessions where I can learn but K-12 education sometimes is created for a test and I think like if you go by the method of, uh, of uh, outliers that Malcolm Gladwell very clearly talks about that if any single person has the opportunity to identify at a very early stage what they are really passionate about and they focus on it and they develop those skills and they make that skill their life or their career, they will be immensely successful at that. Let me give you some examples. Think about sports people. Think about Tom Brady, for example. No Michigan connection there, seriously. So uh, <laughs> so think about Tom Brady and, or think about any sports star. The reason they are so successful is at a very early age, they enter and they find their passion and then they hone their skills hour after hour with a dedicated mentor or a coach who's constantly experimenting with them and trying to find how to perfect their skill. So very early on in their careers, in their 20s or 30s, they became masters of their game. Now, we grew up in societies where very few people get that opportunity to either be a magician or be a sports person or be a leader or be a speaker. A lot of kids at the K-12 level, we grew up in an environment of what do you need to do and what are the basic skills that you need to learn to get a job? That's all you're thinking about. How can I make that perfect salary range annually that me, my family, my friends think is acceptable? And what do I need to do to get to that? Now, the game in the world is changing. The game in the world is not about that nine to five job anymore. It's People are already changing it. People are already talking about it. The next generation is going to think about it completely differently. It's going to be about 
de- identifying what that skill is at an early age and then honing that at an early stage for that to be your career has that changed completely across the world i don't think so but i'm very fascinated that some very visionary superintendents that i have the pleasure of working with have started talking about it and have started doing something about it um and uh it's interesting to see how this industry and the market will evolve i think it will for sure and there are uh, people like us and some superintendents who are working very hard to make that happen yeah so one of the other thing that really fascinates me about you know your journey is when you started elevate k12 um you really pursued a niche and um it's this niche of business to government and that's a really fascinating niche and not many people are willing to go into that so i'm really curious you know when you kind of started this you know how did you end up finding that niche and um i'm just going through that thought process sure it was actually by chance uh, again set of experiments so i came into this country not knowing anything about the k12 system the first time i came into this country was to get is to go to ross um and while i joined the junior achievement program and i was teaching in the schools was the first time i understood working in the low income title 1 schools that a lot of these schools were running without a teacher they had a human body that may be a substitute teacher or there was a software but there wasn't really a teacher so i think traditionally people who were born and raised here had a mindset of oh selling to the government and the k12 schools is tough i seriously didn't know anything whether it was tough or easy um to me as a part of my experiment i found out that the schools had a need and i automatically stumbled upon it a lot of people told me that shelly it's going to be tough and you're going to fail but again those are things that do nothing to me once i am on my path of trying something i need that experiment and data to tell me that this is not going to succeed and not really what the world is saying and that's i think the non non conformist in me i think the moment somebody tells me i can't do something i go into this trigger of i need to figure that out myself i'm not just going to go on here say so i think i stumbled upon it not knowing that selling to government was difficult and having stumbled upon it i don't think it was difficult seriously it depends on what you're selling if you're selling something that's a nice to have was is a good to have was is a must to have i think as we evolved mm-hmm. our product roadmap we went from selling something that was good to have to selling something that was must to have and then instead of fixating on what investors wanted or what is that dream sales number that we wanted to do we fixated on how can we make our instruction better and every decision that we made was around that so i think it was a conglomeration of identifying a need in a market and then building a service that w- that constantly met the evolving need of the school districts and seriously not knowing that selling to government was hard so we didn't go with that mindset so we did everything we could to reach out to them and make a sale sure how all that it seems like a little bit of naivety actually went a long way um and but it's fascinating because you know most people they would have looked at that very subjectively they would have said you know gov- selling to governments is in my opinion um probably not as profitable uh, instead of looking at it objectively maybe through an experiment and so it's really fascinating to me because you keep talking about experiments and this is something <laughs> i definitely wanted to talk about because it seems like your entire success is based on experiments and um the, you know i think a lot of companies do experiments but the one that comes to mind uh the foremost in my head is actually Jeff Bezos. Um I oh, think yeah. he was quoted at one point saying uh the success of Amazon is going to be determined by the number of experiments we can run because mm-hmm. you know if we have 100 failures but one success then that mm-hmm. success is going to drive a lot of our future growth. And so to me I've been really fascinated by this but um the part that's really fascinating about you is that you seem to apply this in your own life in a lot of different ways. So I'm really curious you know when you think about an experiment and you know starting one either for your business or yourself like um where does that how does that start in your mind? couple of ways right so one of the things that my dad taught me when i was a kid and my dad um is an engineering nerd and he taught me decision trees which i did not understand while i was growing up i kind of laughed at it when he would do that but as i grew i started understanding the the uh, actual value of it so it starts with you always have in life in business you always have a fork you either have to take option a or you have to choose option b 
And then you either have a strategy of inductive or deductive reasoning to get to the conclusion. So even when you're thinking about, let's say, business, when I started with Elevate K-12, and I've had two other companies before that, I did a lot of experiments that I failed, trust me. And I'm sure the successful entrepreneurs will talk about that. Nobody talks about those failures because we just do it, we fail, we learn from it, and we just stand up and we move ahead. I think if you are running experiments, you need to make sure that as a person, you also have the perseverance of understanding that this was an experiment and you don't take it personally. You don't take it as a failure, but you take it as, oh, these were the conclusions and the data set points that I got. I learned from it. Let's move on. So when I was starting Elevate K-12 while at school, I was also experimenting with a couple of other businesses. But there were two things that led to it. I think number one was I kind of started with three ideas at the same time. One was a lead generating uh, some germination seed that would grow on rooftops of buildings here. I think the second was a fashion business. And the third was this. Interesting. Um, And... All three of them started, some started in series and some started in parallel because at Michigan, they give you this opportunity to just do whatever you want to do while they are in, while you're in school. Like the, it's not regimented, like these are the uh, classes that you have to take. So this was kind of my experiment in business school, seriously. And I was very fortunate that I was as, at a school where the dean gave me that opportunity, not just gave me the opportunity, but actually gave me a scholarship to run these experiments. So I started with all three, and what I when I started with it was my end goal was to launch the product in the market, and the other two failed because for two reasons: a, I didn't have any prior knowledge or experience in it; I had no background in either lead or fashion. Um, second, I wasn't passionate about it, so every time something would go wrong, my mind would divert into doing something else rather than trying to find a solution for it. When it came to my current company, LOA K-12, A, I had a background in it. So I had a teaching degree. I had an engineering degree. Second, I was immensely passionate about it. I loved it. I could not stop thinking about it. Every time something would go wrong, I would go on overdrive to fix that problem and to analyze it. So it didn't feel like work. It just felt like I was doing something fun. So these experiments running and then somewhere I realized that I found the product market fit and then it just launched into a company after that. So I think that was my business experiment and there have been several at the life level, several. Sure. And this is something that I think I try to implement in my own lives in my own life as well. Um, and one of the things I you actually mentioned uh, when describing um, these experiments is that you said it's really tough getting other people to believe in them. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm really curious, you know, whenever you, you come in and you want to run you know, five or six different experiments on um, some initiative that you guys are considering doing, um, you know, and someone maybe is reluctant to do that. You know, how do you go about that process to um, for, to get people to believe in experimentation when it comes to business. Who do you define as people to believe? Is it my team or is it my investors or is it just the world? Yeah, it's a, uh, <laughs> I, you know, I'm really curious to hear about all three of those aspects, actually, okay. because um, I think each of them bring a different um, thing to the table, right? Sure. I think one thing that I'm usually am is I'm very clear. Uh, I think when I was starting companies, I wasn't, as structured in my experiments as as I am now. It was more about just trying something for fun. But now my experiments, uh, you know, need a certain ROI as as the company is scaling. But there are a couple of ways. I think first, the first thing that I do is I try to identify what I'm trying to experiment on myself. Um, I'll read about it. I'll uh, get some data points. I'll figure out uh, what really is the experiment and what I'm trying to achieve before I bring it out to the world. Then uh, if you follow the Dunbar principle in your life, have you like uh, heard about it? No, I actually have not heard about this. I'm okay. very curious to hear. So a Dunbar principle, what it says, like in today's heavily socially networked world, people think that having 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 connections of friends is great. I actually don't believe in that. I learned it the hard way that you have to be very precise and uh, choosy about who your closest people are. You are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. So the Dunbar principle says is that 
your closest so the way it works is it's concentric circles right so you have your closest five people these are the people that you're constantly talking to you're constantly spending the most time with these people then your next circle is 15 people these are your professional networks your uh, people that you meet at some periodic cadence and then 150 people who are outside of your network anything beyond that is a distraction so that's what the dunbar principle say so i actually studied that four to five years back and really embodied that so when i think about my experiments the people that i talk to are either people who are directly or indirectly impacted by that experiment or these are people who might just trust believe and i'm inspired by and i run it by both of them so if i'm doing a business experiment it would be my team uh talking to them and of course they don't always believe in it but then rationalizing to them and then also it comes down to attracting the right talent to join your company who have that sort of a growth mindset that actually embody change and we actually learned it the hard way that there are a lot of amazing great people in this world but there are some who like change and some who don't so in a company like ours that's constantly experimenting finding that talent that likes change and experimentation is very important so i think that's set number 1 and also people who are not disheartened by the failure of an experiment it's just an experiment i think the second part was finding the right set of investors i think we are extremely blessed i've done a couple of experiments some have worked and some haven't uh and our investors have been very welcoming um about our experiments uh we definitely have to follow a more structured path to them and as we are scaling we are i think the third set would be life experiments on which path of your personal life do you want to go to and and do you want to get into and again those dunbar people uh you know you can run your experiments by them and seek different opinions and that reduces the chances of failure because you have a different perspective so i always listen to people when they when they give me advice but then final decision and conclusion lies with me got it yeah i kind of want to ask more about experimentation but i think this dunbar principle is actually a lot more fascinating <laughs> so i'm going to divert to that um so i'd love to hear more about this because this is something that i think about a lot because you know we have a world that's so connected and I, and 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 people the listeners of the show know that i'm a big believer in the same thing you're average of the five people that you're uh, that you surround yourself with constantly mm-hmm. and so um i'm i'm really curious so how do you stay you know very intentional with you know all the networks and people that we have that we need to cherish right um which are hundreds and thousands to some to some for some people but also uh follow this dunbar principle and stay connected with the very few that will bring us the most um mm-hmm. i guess satisfaction if uh gain um and even just happiness absolutely um that's a great question actually and i learned it the hard way um i learned it from other people i looked patterns of other successful people read about them uh heard and saw what they did um i think it comes down to what you really seek in life and seriously not every person would seek this uh there are some people who inherently seek uh a lot of followers and inherently want that core dependency of thousands of people and that's totally fine so this is not for them this is for people who are self reflective and who are kind of introvertish i would say you know uh but who are constantly seeking to up their game by learning from others so i'll go back to experiments the solar set of experiments so you always network and you meet people i will never lose an opportunity to network and meet people and when you're networking and meeting people you will identify people who serve different purposes in your life some would be people that you're just inspired by and you learn from i have two or three of those people in my life that every time we meet and talk it's almost like reading a book we're constantly inspiring each other and learning from each other i had to go through a lot of people to finally find those and what i learned was that when i find the wrong set of people you don't have to be arrogant about never talking to them you just decide what percentage of the time of your life your span of life from the time you're born to the time you die are you going to spend on those people so you have to cautiously make that decision you're probably going to displease a lot of people you are going to make a lot of people unhappy but then ultimately you will make your um 
think about qualified leads. So you're basically looking for qualified leads to make the data set of people that you're constantly interacting with very rich. And that's what you're doing. And that, again, comes with meeting a lot of people. But then you first have to start with defining what it means to you. I have run several algorithms and data spreadsheets on what are the characteristics of people that I want in my Dunbar. And then I actively seek for those as I'm networking. And when I find those, I look for consistency in those characteristics. And then I say, hey, I think you can be in my Dunbar. And sometimes they want to be and sometimes they don't. And then I just go on my quest again. And I think this goes into hiring talent in our company. So we actually follow very similar patterns in our company. We have long interview processes in our company. A lot of people don't like that, but this is literally what we're trying to do. Wow. Um, so there's two sets of people that you mentioned. Uh, I'm really curious to tap into how you found those people. So the first set you mentioned was the you, you said that you read about um, a lot of successful people. So um, who are those people that you really rooted um, you know, a lot of your basic philosophies mm-hmm. and perspectives from? Oh, yeah. I, I have my set very clear on that. Uh, so I'm not a big movie buff. I don't enjoy fiction. Um, I've never enjoyed fiction. Uh, So most of the people that I look up to, most of the people that I follow are business and thought leaders. Uh, So of course, Jeff Bezos, absolutely. Uh, I've probably read every single book of his. Uh, I am, as you can see by the way I talk, I embody that experimentation. I've seen my father go through it as well. So I've kind of grown up in that. And then when I see someone who's really been successful, it kind of makes a lot of sense. I think the second person uh, that I really look up to is Harvard Skulls. I had a chain of restaurants in India. Uh, that was my uh, second company that I started, which I sold. Um, I While I was building uh, my restaurants, I read a lot of Starbucks books, like Starbucks Experience, Pour Your Heart Out. And that really helped me get inside Harvard Skull's brain. And building that experience and building those aha moments for users and consumers. So I would say that uh, these two people, for sure. Then very recently, I read a book called Principles by Ray Dalio, uh, Principles of Work and Life. And again, it's that book is like a reference guide. Like You can literally go back to different principal numbers as you face challenges and successes in your life and read and learn and then take it forward. So I would say, and there are several others, but I would say at the top of my mind, um, these are these three people. And then in my professional network, I have met several people who've filled different voids and gaps. I have several amazing successful entrepreneurs that I've learned from successful investors. Uh, you know, my first investor, Andrew Bloom, I learned a lot from him, like how he has managed me as an entrepreneur by giving me the free hand to experiment, but also guiding me and questioning my wrong choices. Uh, Again, I learned a lot from him. Um, So several people, but I think these are the few that come to my mind right away. Yeah, I appreciate you sharing that. And you know, I should have guessed principles by Ray Dalio was going to be on that list just because of the way that you're so appreciative of experiments and how objective you are instead of being subjective. Um, have you read that book? Have you read that? I haven't read it all the way, but I have read um, the majority of it. It's kind of, I kind of go through a few books at a time. So it's something that I'm currently reading. And mm-hmm. the thing that I find so fascinating about that book is, and some, this is something you actually mentioned earlier, is not everyone is willing to accept that kind of change. So to give a little bit of context in this, Ray Dalio's book um, really talks about uh, the concept that I've been mentioning the entire podcast, which is, you know, be a lot more, a lot less subjective and be a lot more objective. And Mm -hmm. um, even with, you know, experimentation that you mentioned and a lot of those factors, and it really makes your life very simple and um, allows you to make critical decisions very well. Um, Mm -hmm. And I think the part that really fascinates me is that when, you come, you approach certain people with a uh, very objective view or um, that, that he kind of promotes in the book. Not many people are willing to take that, whether yeah. it's criticism. And even if you do it with tact, poise, um, not, willi- not many people are willing to, like you said, uh, want to change um, because that's what's needed in order to drive, you know, the, the company, themselves, whatever the factor is. Um, and so that's really fascinating. I, I should have predicted that. But, but <laughs> um, but yeah, so and, the, uh, and and go, seriously, go ahead, which is which is totally fine, right? I mean, that's how some people choose to live their lives, and a lot of people do not agree with how I live my life, and that's totally fine. 
Um, so and have you have you just kind of uh, sorry to interrupt there, but um, mm-hmm. so do you just kind of you know restrict those people from your life? Um, I'm very curious how you respond to that. Um, you know, maybe that push from people that don't see it that way. Um, no, I don't need to restrict them. You know, I am very open minded to having different viewpoints in my life. I have a lot of friends who live lives very differently. I have a lot of uh, customers I work with. I have a lot of family that live their life extremely differently. Um, I have a lot of appreciation for everybody's choices of what they have. But when it comes to my lifespan and when I look at it and I break my life into the percentage of time that I spend, I think I will cautiously uh, make decisions of how I spend from whom I can learn and what I do with it. I, I I actually, so without naming a person, so I have a very close friend of mine and she once was talking to me and I learn a lot from her. She's a decade younger than me, but um, she and I were once talking and she was talking about this extremely successful person who started this founders network and how he lives his life with extreme discipline. And I've actually seen that. And uh, those choices of extreme discipline means we all have only 24 hours in our life. So whom we choose to spend it with and how we spend has to be a conscious decision. So it's nothing to do with the person. It's just to do with how much time you have. And unfortunately, we all have only 24 hours. Now, maybe one of these fascinating entrepreneurs changes that, but we'll see how that goes. And and Shaley, you mentioned the there's another subset of people that you mentioned. You said that there's two to three, you know, close people that are within your Dunbar circle that you keep up with and you spend the majority of your time, right? Um, or at least you value their opinion the most. And so for me, that's really uh, interesting because um, it, it, this is almost like 80 20 in your relationships, and 80 20 is a principle that I talk about a lot mm-hmm. on this show. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's very difficult to do with people, right? Because it almost feels like you like you have to have. Um, the other person reciprocate that mm-hmm. same kind of commitment on both ends. Um, so I'm really curious when you have someone that is you're very close with on the Dunbar show, how do you approach that conversation so that you guys can, you and the other person can both kind of be effective with each other? Oh, that is such a great question. Seriously. Um, I never thought of it until now, but here is, I think how it goes. I think it's mutual. Uh, and if, if the connection is positive from both the ends, I think the sparks will be on both the ends. I mean, I, I would say it's just like dating. Like once you start talking and the conversation moves, you just feel those sparks moving and you have this uh, this immense sense of satisfaction from the conversation and you can't wait for your next conversation. And when you're talking to that person, you're not talking about people, but you're talking about ideas that make you better. Again, that's something that I seek. Now, if I think about say my father, he seeks conversation around science. So I may or may not be in his Dunbar. So for me, my Dunbar and closest five people are over the years, I think some who are very close to me personally, that's a couple of my family members, but the others whom I have met along the way. And I realized that there was a lot of consistency in every interaction that I had with them. And the trust was built with every interaction. And it takes time to get there. It's not an on-off switch. But I think multiple conversations take you there. And I've also noticed that as you age and mature, your Dunbar might shift a little bit. And that's okay. Sure. Yeah, I definitely, uh, this is, I haven't had that same perspective as in having my own Dunbar circle, but I've definitely heard this concept referenced many different ways. And so, um, yeah, I think for sharing that, it's really fascinating. Um, and, and Shaley, one of the other things I really wanted to talk about is, uh, your job now, which is being a CEO. And that's really the part that really gets me, um, about you is that, you know, you switched from a founder to a CEO and which is very, which people don't, I guess, recognize, but that's very rare in the industry that the same person who founded a company is still leading the company years later. And so, um, you know, one of the things you mentioned is that, you know, your job has kind of shifted to being a motivator. And so I was really curious, um, you know, how did you kind of, uh, prepare for that transition? Sure. So I'm actually transitioning. So I haven't switched, but I'm switching. Um, so, um, I, I learned that that switch was coming because, again, a couple of people in my Dunbar who've built companies successfully and have gone from being founders or early stage employees to continuing to lead the company at the C-suite level. So firstly, learned a lot from them. And I went on this conquest of 
learning and understanding. And I actually read this book. So it's written by the Kaufman Foundation. It's called Leading at the Speed of Growth. Uh, and it's it's such an immensely amazing book. And what that book does is it says that any startup goes through four or five stages of growth. And then as a founder, it literally lays down how your job is going to change through every stage, your startup phase, your initial phase, your rapid growth phase, continuous growth phase and maturity. So that has been an eye opener for me. And any founder that is going through that transition like I am, I would highly recommend reading that book. So number one is that. Number two is learning from the failures or the successes of other founder CEOs. There are a lot of them who did not make it and there are a lot of them that did make it. I don't know if I am or I am not going to. I, I think I'm going to try my best too. But uh, I think learning from that is, again, immensely valuable. And, of course, having the right set of, uh, right set of uh, investors who've seen several companies go through that and having mentors. Uh, people have always asked me, Shelley, do you have a mentor? I don't have a particular mentor, but I have different mentors in my life that I learn different things from. I have this one mentor that I learned finance and fundraising from. Uh, I have one mentor that I learned sales growth from. I have one mentor that I learned, uh, you know, education, like as a superintendent, I learn a lot from him. So I think there are, so a combination of all of these things and then constantly changing and learning. So that's number one. I think number two was also hiring the right people. So every stage that your company goes through, unfortunately, you have to keep changing the people that are required for each phase because a set of people that were immensely valuable at the startup phase may not have the skill sets to be uh, ready for the initial or the rapid growth phase. So the people who are able to move from phase to phase are the people who are constantly evolving and learning and growing. And then there are some who may just be great for that phase. And we need both kinds of people. So those are some of the things that I am learning. And I'm still in that phase of moving from founder to CEO. And then rather than getting things done, uh, I mean, rather than doing things, it's about how do you get things done now that you have this amazing executive team that is ready to lead and build processes and take it to the next level. So it's it's been a very interesting transition. I look at it as an experiment. We'll see what the conclusion is after a few years. Yeah, well, I really appreciate you sharing that. Um, I can't imagine being in your shoes and just there's so many different factors of that. And I, I, I feel like it's uh, if you haven't, you know, been a part of entrepreneurship or experienced entrepreneurship, you might not appreciate that transition. But um, yeah, thank you so much for uh, sharing a little bit about that. And, 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 you know, as you're talking, you kind of already mentioned this a little bit is that you're, 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 you have so many different people in your life that you're constantly learning from. It seems like you read a lot, a lot of different books. Um, and so I was kind of wondering a little bit about more about that. Um, so, you know, how do you constantly stay a learner? Um, is it, how do you kind of schedule your weeks or your months mm -hmm. so that you are kind of staying on top of your game? Cause you mentioned earlier, you know, education is something that, um, it's not something you do from, you know, your zero to, you know, 20, it's something that you actually do your, your entire life. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it needs to be intrinsic. I think the conquest for learning uh, and self-improvement, I personally believe, is really not something that you can teach someone. Then needs, I mean, you can you can definitely teach it, but the desire to do it can't be forced upon someone. That's what I mean. There has to be some desire in an individual to learn and to have curiosity on what the next in the world is. Is there an other part of the world that I don't know about? And if they have that, they're going to find ways to make it happen. And if they don't have that curiosity, then they're not going to try and make that happen. And if you find the latter person who does not have that curiosity and you try and force fit them with this, it's never going to work. And that relationship or the dynamic is never going to be successful. So. I think for me, it's always been a constant curiosity on what's on the other side. This has been right since I was a child. Um, I never had a lot of friends. I was always a nonconformist, just trying to do my own thing. Um, once I really fixated on something and I was passionate about it intrinsically, I gave it my best. And then the self-conquest came from learning, reading, uh, you know, meeting people and learning from them. It was just 
a cycle that I followed and pattern recognized and just kept doing it. And I also sure. am very cautious about uh, not involving myself in situations and people uh, that may not add a lot to our lives. And sometimes we just have to make that conscious decision, like I said. Sure. So as you're kind of going about maybe your week or your month, right? And um, you, I feel like you have to kind of make time for this, this is something kind of like mm-hmm. you said, you have to, you know, be very active about. Mm-hmm. So um, how do you go about uh, actually like fitting all this, um, all the different aspects of learning, whether it's reading, whether it's speaking with people and networking? Um, how do you kind of fit that within your schedule? Sure. Uh, So there are a couple of ways that I do it. Like as our company is scaling, I get less and less time for it, but weekends. So uh, Monday to Friday is war. There's absolutely no time that I have for self-learning. You know, uh, so the first thing that I do, the the first and one of the most important thing is a clear mind, right? So uh, you must have heard about it and you must have read about it when people talk about keeping less distractions in your mind. Like you wear similar kinds of clothes or you do the same kind of routine every day. You eat the same kind of food. You have the same kind of coffee. All of that is actually immensely valuable because you are giving your brain the opportunity to learn something new. And so that there are lesser and lesser non-intelligent, self-improving variables in your life. Okay. So you have your set of constants and you keep your constants to a limit. Then, then what you do is you have a routine. Uh, you know, every day in the morning, I'm an early riser. I get up early in the morning. I run for 30 minutes, listening to music without any lyrics. And that's the time that I'm self-reflecting. I love progressive house music. I think it takes you into a deep focus uh, world. And that's a self-reflecting phase for me. So that's actually those 30 minutes are my carved out time for self-reflection. Um, The other part that I do is weekends. I carve out about three to four hours to read. I cautiously do that. Come what way, I'm absolutely doing that. I also, when it comes to networking events, I have less and less time for it. But as and when I have time, I do go to these events and networking events where I can meet like-minded people. Uh, The fourth thing that I do is uh, I took, um, I took on scuba diving about five years back. And again, Uh, it's been immensely great as a learning experience because when you go on those trips, you meet like-minded people. And I've met some of the most fascinating people in my life on my scuba driving trips. Um, And then, uh, so I think those are some of the timings and some times in my life that I have carved where I do self-reflection or learn. Sure, sure. So you feel like just having that that constant having those constants um, really allows you to, you know, whenever you do craft, create time to learn, read, network, whatever it's, uh, you're able to maximize, um, I guess, kind of the consciousness of that. Is that, is that, does that sound yeah. right? Yeah. So it's a, it's a mix of what percentage of that has to be self-reflection. So when I'm running with no lyrics or when I'm scuba diving, that's your calm time, you know, that's your calm time that you're self-reflecting. You're basically pattern recognizing. That's what you're doing. And you have to cautiously do that. Every time you make a wrong decision, you have to go back and you have to pattern recognize it. So that next time when a similar problem arises, you already know in your brain that you have pattern recognized this. So you have to go a different route. Um, And that's something that we've embodied in our company as well. I'm constantly talking to my team about that. And then there are times that you actually go and seek it out from people. Sure, sure. Yeah, thank you for that. And then, um, so I guess this is a good time for us to maybe transition a little bit um, away from the things that we've been talking about um, into a segment that I call the hot seat. So okay. this is something where I get to kind of, um, you know, I, I know we typically on the show are known for um, diverting and talking about a bunch of random things, but this segment is in particular gets to focus on that. So I really look forward to this. Um, so I have four questions for you, Shaylee. So, mm-hmm. um, the first one is, you know, if you had the, and then I actually, I'm, I'm going to admit, I actually <laughs> stole this one from Tim Ferriss, but I thought this would be really interesting for you. Um, so if you actually had a giant billboard that you could rent out and put some message on there, um, what would it say? Keep experimenting. <laughs> I love that, that. Should, I love that. that should not be a surprise given all that we've spoken about thus far. <laughs> right. No, no, for sure. I love that. Um, 
So what what are what are some books, maybe one or two, that you gift or recommend the most? Well, um, the book that I've probably gifted the most is most is Principles by Ray Dalio. And also the power of habit when it comes to people close to me, uh, whom I know personally, uh, when it comes to business book, uh, one that I uh, have given recently to most of my team members is a high growth handbook. Um, I think it's a new book that talks about and interviews um, different successful executives from a lot of startups like Stripe and Dropbox. And I think these are the few books that come to my mind that I've gifted recently. Got it. Yes, yeah, so a high growth handbook is not something that I've heard of, but um, that one I'm definitely gonna have to read. So I appreciate mm-hmm. that. Absolutely. Um, and and you mentioned habits uh, is something that, that you're uh, really fond of. Um, you know, one thing I, I love asking people is, you know, if there's one routine that you would keep, like, you know, if, if you had a really busy week and you couldn't keep any of your habits, but there's only one that you could, uh, what would that be? So I would say. Um running every day for 30 minutes, even if it's just 30 minutes, it's not for weight loss or not just for fitness, but it just helps you deal with problems and creates enzymes in your system that helps you solve the problem differently. So I would say having a routine or a discipline of some form of exercise every day, even if it's just 30 minutes, according to me, is extremely crucial. Sure. Yeah. I'm a big believer in that too. Um, And so what's one aspect of your life that you're really glad you automated? And the reason I ask this is because I feel like there's a lot of aspects in our lives we just kind of hand away and let other people do it or also let tech do it. But Mm -hmm. I'm really curious, what's something that you have done that you've really appreciated? Oh, yeah. I'm just going to say something totally non-business. I hate shopping completely. Like, I absolutely hate walking into a store and shopping. Um, So... What I've completely automated is all my purchases are online completely Uh, because, like I said, as as many constants as I can have in my life. And this is one of those. I don't need to get distracted by uh, distractions in a big store. Uh, So shopping is something that I've completely automated in my life. And that's changed and given me more given me more time to do other other more important ROI things in my life. Sure. Um. And, and, and Sheila, as we kind of round out this segment, uh, one of the things that I want to touch up on that I always try to ask people on this show is about their failures. Because I feel like, you know, when someone looks at your life, they can see this. Um, someone who has experimented numerous times has been really found the ones that have really worked has been highly successful. And I think sometimes um, we forget about those failures. And you mentioned this earlier. We don't even talk to most, you know well-known entrepreneurs and business folks, we don't ever mention failures. Um, that's just something that societally we don't talk about. So it's something I try to highlight on the show. So, you know, are there any failures that you think of when you look back at your life as maybe an early entrepreneur or just things that have really helped shape where you are today? There have been so many, um, so many along the way. And I probably make one every week or every month or every quarter. If you are a risk taker and if you're not, leading a life void of risks, there are going to be failures, 100%, because you're taking a risk. By the nature of the word, it means that there are going to be failures. So I really, I've had several failures, personal, professional, several of them, but I've never considered it to be a failure. I, do, I mean, that word means nothing to me. It does nothing to my brain. It, there have been several challenges. There have been several things that have almost broken me, but I've never broken. Um, it's always been a bounce back. It's always been, okay, it's happened. What can I do about it? What can I learn from it? And then moving on from it. Um, I think there are a couple of them that come to my life. Um, one that is, that was an early failure or challenge in my life was growing up. I did not have a normal childhood. I can speak well now. Uh, but As a child, I used to stammer. And when I stammered, what that mean, what that meant was that I couldn't socialize and I had this quest of knowledge. So I was not able to talk to a person, let alone talk to a crowd. So my early challenge in life was going through therapy, having a difficult childhood of this disability that I had. But what that taught me was it taught me to adapt and change to circumstances. It taught me survival tactics. It, it, it taught me how to deal with awkwardness. And Malcolm Gladwell talks about the advantages of 
disadvantages. So kids who have some sort of a learning problem, given the right external growth environment, they learn tricks and tactics to survive at an early stage, and that makes them successful as adults. Um, he talks about how the distribution of responses to an obstacle is bimodal. So I think that was a very early challenge in my life. Imagine going from grade one to grade eight, not being able to talk at all and surviving that. I think my second challenge was when I started selling our service to schools here, uh, you know, changing that mind shift of our customer who was skeptics to users on why should tutoring not be the norm and why should just using software not be the norm. And there is another way to deliver instruction. What I was talking about, this woman who's just come from India. I think that was a challenge initially of converting a skeptic to a user and not just a user, but a customer for life. So I think those were some early challenges. And of course, fundraising with no prior experience to any entrepreneur who does it for the first time is always a challenge. But then you learn that it's a math. It's a math about qualified set of investors. And you need to have the faith that if your product has a need and it is scaling, the investors and the right set of investors will come. So I think those are three critical challenges that I can see shape my life over the years. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. And, um, you know, I know we're almost out of time. And so one of the things that I wanted to make sure I made time for was this belief that you have that success is kind of based on the one skill that you can really develop. And you mentioned this earlier, actually, when you were talking about Malcolm Gladwell. Um, but I'm really curious, you know, you know, when you look at your own life, um, how do you how do you see that skill of yours that you've developed um, based on the philosophy that you have? Sure. I think over the years through my companies, apart from education, and I've been in this industry for a really long time, and that's been my skill. Um, over the years, uh, right from being a teacher to starting a chain of preschools in India to starting Elevate K-12 and seeing Elevate K-12 evolve, uh, it's not been an on-off session um, uh, switch where I had an answer. But we every step, every service that we launched, we got better at it. So I think how to create positive learning experiences has been a skill set of mine. I think the other thing would be starting companies. Uh, I think that's also just a skill set. Again, learn from failures and successes. So I would say these, if I look back and say, what are my two critical skill sets, I would say it would be these two. Sure. So whenever someone comes to you and they ask for advice, whether it's someone in college or high school, um, they see the good work that you're doing. And so they come to you. Um, what do you kind of recommend to them knowing that this is the perspective that you have that uh, you mentioned, you know, the one on, you know, really honing in the one or two skills that you're yeah. really good at? I think one thing that I would definitely tell today's new generation is focus. Do not get distracted by what's happening around you. Uh, focus and do what you love and put in the long hours needed to be the best at it. As the world is moving to a skill-based workforce, our successes are going to be based on that one skill set that you are really good at. And that doesn't happen overnight. That's going to be some series and some parallel experiments for you to figure out what that passion of yours is. Find that, be on a conquest of finding that passion. And once you find that early in your career, put in the number of hours to sharpen it and be the best at it. But that would require a lot of focus, a lot of sacrifices. And I think people who are able to do it will definitely succeed in life. Awesome. Awesome. I love that. Well, Shaley, um, I think um, I, I'll say this for myself. Like I had a really, this has probably been one of the most fascinating podcast recordings that I've done today, just because um, I think you have a very unique story, but you've obviously have pursued it to uh, a, a very, um, I think, intentional extreme, um, especially when, whether it comes to experimentation or just the businesses that you've run. It's been fascinating to kind of see that. Um, and so um, thank you so much for uh, making the time to uh, do this. I'm uh, very glad to have connected with you in my time at BAM. Yash, thank you so much for having me on. This was really fun. If 
you like what you heard on the Yash and Company podcast, go ahead and subscribe to stay up to date on all things Yash and Company. If you check out our website at yashandco.com, we'll actually mail you a free sticker if you subscribe. But until next Wednesday, ladies and gentlemen, this is Yash signing out.